And amen. Thank you, Samus. What a beautiful worship service this is. What a wonderful night it is to be in the house of the Lord, to be here on Shabbat. Shabbat shalom to everyone. Welcome back. We're glad you could be with us. For our visitors, we're in a series that God gave me, a vision of a tree. It's a vision he's given all of us for the tree is mentioned more in Scripture than any other living thing other than human beings. It's amazing that trees are mentioned almost 600 times in the Word of God, for they are a living example of what God wants us to understand. And in God's economy, there, were, there are many valuable lessons to be learned from the tree, and we've talked about the ground, and that was part one. Then we talked about the seed, the roots. Last week was the trunk. This week we're going to talk about the branches. Next week the leaves, and after that the fruit. And God has given us this wonderful picture of the tree. And in Genesis 2 and 8, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed, and the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And continuing in verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Tonight in our beautiful Torah walk service, you heard the Torah described as God's Word, written on parchment, wrapped around two poles, two wooden poles called the Eitz Chaim, the Tree of Life. And the traditional statement over the Torah is, Vezot HaTorah, Asher Samoshe, Lifnei B'nei Yisrael, Apiad Onai, Biad Moshe. This is the Torah, which Moses placed before the children of Israel. It's in accord with the Lord's command by the hand of Moses. A tree of life it is for those that take hold of it. And blessed are the ones who support it. All its ways are pleasantness and all its paths are peace. Long life is in its right hand and riches and honor in its left The Lord was pleased for the sake of his righteousness to render the Torah great and glorious. A tree of life it is for those that take hold of it. Now we see in the garden two trees. The tree of the knowledge, our heads, our sight. The knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of life. God's word planted in our midst. How wonderful it is that we can embrace And receive God's word and then the living word in Messiah Yeshua. As I was preparing, I shared with you this parable that God gave me. The children of the kingdom of God are like the trees where the seasons change the outward appearance. But the root never changes. In its season, people gaze upon the buds and marvel at the branches. In its season, the colors change. Like, Jacob, like Joseph's robe, burst forth and people stand in awe. And when winter comes and the, leave, and the trees shed their beautiful leaves and their outward appearance becomes bleak and bare, there is no longer any interest in the tree. But beneath the surface, the root grows deeper, yet no one sees. Last week, we talked about lessons learned from the trunk of the tree. There's seven lessons, spiritual lessons in each one of these messages. Last week in the lesson on the, on the trunk of the tree, we learned that lesson number one, like our bodies, it too houses the internal systems which feeds and nourishes the limbs, and we must be careful to take care of our bodies, for they are the temple of the Lord. Lesson number two, the trunk can be used for both the clean and the profane. We read that the Ark of the Covenant was made of wood, but so was the Asherah pole. And so it was that both the clean and the profane were made out of the trunk of the tree. And if we follow God's instructions, only good will come from our bodies and the body of Messiah. 
The third lesson is we studied the oak tree and the palm tree was if the tree remains too rigid, it will break or be uprooted. And if we remain too rigid and fail to find a good balance, we too can break or be uprooted. The fourth lesson we learned from the trunk was if you cut the bark of the trunk, it will bear an external reminder of that cut. But if you cut the heartwood, the tree may be wounded beyond recovery. Choose your words carefully that they do not cut to the heart of another. Lesson number five we learned last week, the careful carpenter uses the right tools and the right wood for the job. He measures twice and cuts once, so too we are to listen twice as much as we speak. The sixth lesson we learned was like the bark of the tree is for the protection against the elements, pests, disease, and infection, so we must be tough-skinned and not allow any offense to take hold. And the seventh lesson we learned from that trunk was the same tree that has become a stumbling block in the form of the cross has also become the altar of our salvation. What the enemy means for evil, God will work for his glory. Tonight we look at the branches. A tree branch's job is to provide a way for the tree leaves to act as a net for sunlight. The branch will go, grow to give the most leaves the most light, even if that means growing sideways. There are other factors that affect the way branches grow as well. Gravity pulls the branches downward, and branch growth is affected by the wind. Part of the trade-off any tree has to make is between gathering light, staying stable in the wind, and succeeding against nearby competitors. So when a tree branches grow crookedly, that's part of a tree's overall survival strategy. Trees have sensors that detect light and gravity. From the, movement a tree, from the moment a tree begins its life, it knows which end is up. Trees will generally attempt to grow towards the light and away from gravitational pull. But a tree, as a tree gets older, its branches tend to grow more outwards than upwards. And so the tree can cast a wider net to catch the light of the sun. Branches unable to support themselves are sealed off then die and fall off the tree. And branches on the interior of a shade tree that do not receive adequate light will die and eventually fall. In our study of the tree, we've begun to see that God has given us something physical and tangible, something we see every day to illustrate His presence and design. In the study of the branches, we see yet again what God is telling us about the supernatural as He shows us the natural. Just as Yeshua and the Father are one, God's plan has always been for us through Him to be one with Him. We take the trees for granted. We pass by them every day. Some are majestic and some are scrawny. Some are beautiful. And in this study on the tree, we begin to look at the ground, the very ground in which it grows in. Who of us can take that dust of the earth and breathe into it and bring it life? Who of us can create what God has created? Who of us can birth a tree? For in God's perfect plan, He's laid the very foundation in which we look out there to see in the natural what God is trying to show us in the supernatural. He has given us the tree mentioned almost 595 times, almost 600 times in Scripture. Trees and wood mentioned more often than any other living thing other than man. He wants us to look at the tree. He wants us to look at the tree of life and understand this tree, to break it down in its component parts, to study it, to understand it, so that we too may understand His Word. Isaiah 4 and 2 says, In that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and the glory of the survivors in Israel. Jeremiah 23 and 5, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. This is the name by which the branch will be called. The Lord our righteousness. 
Zechariah 6 and 12 begins, tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne. In Matthew 13 and 31, he told them another parable. This is Yeshua talking. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. John 15 and 1 tells us the story of the vine and the branches. A story which we must understand in our lives if we're to understand in the natural what God wants us to see in the supernatural. For who of us has not been pruned by the Lord? And who of us has not been disciplined? And no discipline and no pruning feels good at the time, but it's for one purpose and one purpose only, to provide room for new growth. And if we look at the Word of God in John 15 and 1, it says, I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the Word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." All of you are Tomadim. All of you are disciples of God. And each one of you that has the book, the Word of God, each one of you has good instruction. In the story of our lives, as it unfolds, if you are bearing no fruit, your life is in sin. If there is no fruit in your life for the kingdom of God, it's because you are in sin. And you will not be pruned, you will be disciplined by God. But if your life is bearing fruit for the Lord, He will prune you. For a vine left untended will stop bearing fruit. It will grow wild. And it grows past the point of being productive. And if in our lives we're not pruned to make room for new growth, we will stop bearing fruit. We must look at the condition of our lives, and if we are bearing no fruit in our lives, we need to take a look at the sin in our life, and we need to stand against it. Whatever it is we're doing that's causing us not to bear fruit for God, we must stand against it. We must turn away from it. We must repent to do an about face, to leave it behind so that we can begin to bear fruit. And if we are bearing fruit for the Lord, we must receive His pruning. How do you think it feels to the rose bush when you come along with a pair of shears? You're cutting off my limb, you're cutting off my branch, that hurts. But next spring, look at the abundance of new growth. And look how the rose bush looks at itself and says, look at me now. I'm the most beautiful in your garden. Look at me now. For when the time comes that we begin to bear much fruit for God because He's pruned us to bring about new fruit in our life, we begin to feel good about the harvest. We forget about the pruning, but I can assure you that the next pruning will come. For if we're not growing, just like the tree, we're dying. As we look at these lessons learned from the tree, we must understand in God's economy that pruning is for the production of new growth. 
As we build up a head of steam for the Lord with our own plans, there's times when we get stopped. And the Lord says, put the reins on. Back off those plans. There's a work I want to do with you. We must receive that work. The only way you can tell the difference between discipline and pruning is not by how it feels because neither one feels good. It's only by looking at the fruit in your life. And if you're bearing no fruit, it's because your commitment to your sin is greater than than your commitment to God's plan for your life. Yeshua said, you are the branches. Romans 11, 11. What led me to the Lord? Romans 11, 11. For 45 years I was provoked, but finally to the point, provoked envy. And as we read Romans 11, 11, I again I asked, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Talking about my Jewish people talking about our six million Jewish people in Israel. Did they stumble so, fall, so, so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentile, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? Fullness is always... And I say always referred to as the reflection, the fullness of Messiah in our lives. The fullness of God's presence. This is the fullness. It's the fullness God's referring to. When Messiah is so alive in us that there is more of Him and less of us to the point we come to the end of ourselves. I am talking to you Gentiles and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own, bro- my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what there will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root. The root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. For those who have heard that the church has replaced Israel, if He could break His covenant with Israel, what makes you think He wouldn't break His covenant with you? If He would break His promises to Israel, the apple of His eye, what makes you think that you matter more than Israel? That you matter more than the place of the return of Messiah? Or that the church would matter more than God's plan of salvation for all mankind. That those who were first set apart shall remain set apart. And that God's plan of salvation for one is the same as it is for all. That no one comes to the Father but through the Son. Not to the Son. We don't pray to the Son. We pray through the Son. For that is access to that throne. When I see the image that God portrays in those scriptures, I see Yeshua sitting at the right hand of God, pulling on Abba's talit, saying, Abba, Father, hear their cry. They know me. They come to you in my name. Hear them now. Grant what they ask in my name. They come to you through me. As you tune your radios tomorrow, you'll hear that more of our Jewish people have accepted Messiah in the last 19 years than the last 19 centuries. God is on the move. 
And when we understand the role of the branches to provoke Israel to envy, that we would stand together, Jew and Gentile, one and Messiah, that we will usher in His return together. It's not a one or the other, it's one and the other, standing together shoulder to shoulder. For in God's kingdom, in the Spirit, there is no Greek and there is no Jew, there is no male and female, but look around. There's females and males in this room. There's Jews and Gentiles in this room. God didn't make a mistake when He made you Jewish. And God didn't make a mistake when He made you Gentile. He called all of us together for such a time as this. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He would not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in His kindness. This is your instruction, this is your admonition that you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? This is a great mystery, but it's simple. That we're gathered here, and as people drive by and see the parking lot is full, and they see the sign that says, Celebrate Shabbat at Bethel, a Messianic Jewish congregation, they say, Whoa, what's going on there? The other parking lots aren't full. This parking lot is full. What's going on? And there's a move of God. Jew and Gentile standing together, one a Messiah. As we've heard about the branches, let us look at seven lessons learned from the branch. The tree and its branches know which way is up from the very beginning of its life. It spends its entire life seeking new heights, even defying gravity. We too must demonstrate the commitment of the branches to resist the pull of the world and seek new heights in Him. Lesson number two, like the branches, if we do not receive adequate light, Yeshua, we will die and eventually fall. Lesson number three, from humble beginnings as a seed, a tree will grow forth and its branches will become a resting place for many. So too, we cannot despise the day of small beginnings, but must press on to the mark of the high calling of Messiah for us as a body to become a resting place for many. Lesson number four, apart from the tree, the branch can do nothing. Separation from God and doing things on our own will yield the same results. Nothing. Lesson number five, any branch that does not bear fruit is cut off and thrown into the fire. We must bear fruit in order to remain an active part of the tree. Bring a Jewish friend to services. Make yourself known in the community. Go visit Max's Delicatessen. Eat a rye bread sandwich. Eat some chopped liver. It couldn't hurt. Eat a pickle. Be a mensch. Lesson number six, branches must be pruned to make room for new growth. If we are to bear much fruit, we too need to be pruned, refined, and be willing to feel the sharp shears of the one who will prune us so that we may bear much fruit for his kingdom. And lesson number seven, branches can be grafted into a tree and receive the nourishment from the root, but the branches do not support the root. The root supports the branches. For us to make a real difference in God's kingdom, we must share together in the rich roots of Israel and our Jewish heritage so that we, Jew and Gentile, may become one in Messiah to make Israel envious enough to cry out, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. We've been talking about the tree. And no branch on its own can do anything separated from the tree. It can bear no fruit. It cannot continue with its life. 
And any branch that is cut off will be thrown into the fire. God gives us this example to show us that in and of ourselves we can accomplish nothing. But only by being attached to Him, our source of life, the tree of life. The tree of life that God described to us in the very beginning in the garden. The tree of life, the branch that he said would come, that branch, the branch, is Yeshua. He said, there'll come forth a rod out of Jesse, a branch will grow from its root. Yeshua was that branch that God spoke about. He said, abide in me and I will abide in you. What does it mean to abide? Remain, to dwell, to tabernacle, to be in His presence, to invite Him into our lives so that we would do more with Him. God has a plan. Its plan is for life, not for death. It's not His desire to cut off any branch and throw it in the fire, but those that try to do it on their own. Those that try to use their sickle, their their heads, the cupping, their senses to try to figure it all out, can't do it without Him. God has laid out for us His perfect will. We tend to hang out in His permissive will. But God wants each and every one of us to draw closer to Him, to abide in Him so He may abide in us. To enter into his, into his presence, not just once a week on Shabbat, but to enter in and to stay there. To draw upon the nourishing sap, the living water that flows into and up through the roots, out to the branches, through the branch, Messiah. You may say, Rabbi, what do I have to do to abide in Him? I, I don't get it. I don't understand. How do I, how do I abide in something? How do I remain in something? It's really quite simple. God laid out a plan, and when I talked about no one comes to the Father but through the Son, that Son's name was Jesus. We call Him Yeshua, the Hebrew word for salvation. The Word of God says that salvation has come to the Jews. Salvation has come from the Jews. And here we are together. God's plan of salvation no longer exclusive to the Jewish people, but available to all, Jew and Gentile alike. The Word of God says, For God so loved the world, all the world. That He sent His only begotten Son. Same word used and the same words used in the story about Abraham and Isaac. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, and sacrifice him in the place I will tell you about. It's not a new story. It's just one story. It's the same story from Genesis to Revelation. That God has a hunger and a desire to draw His people back to Him. But we have to come to the end of ourselves. We have to come to a point where we say that we can do nothing without Him. He is the Creator. We are the creation. And we need Him. We need His plan. You say, well, how do I do that, Rabbi? How do I abide in Him? You say a simple prayer. You say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. Well, you haven't killed anybody. You haven't robbed anybody. You haven't run anybody over. 
I bet you've certainly lied. You've certainly taken something that didn't belong to you. I mean, if you didn't take it, you thought about it. And that all separates us from God. But God sent a sacrifice. He sent an atonement. He sent a blood covering. He sent Yeshua. And you say, Lord, I'm sorry I sinned against you. I believe that Yeshua died for my sins. And that through his shed blood I am forgiven. And I believe he died on that sacrifice tree. And on the third day he rose again. And he's sitting at the right hand of God interceding for me. And because he lives, I can have life eternal. If you've never said that prayer before and you want to abide in him so that he will abide in you if you want to come into his presence and stay there for the rest of your days on earth and forever just say yes to him just say yes it's a three letter word but for some people it's the hardest three letter word they can ever say Change will come. Fruit will come into your life. Your attitude about your life will change. Your attitude about your circumstances will change. Yeshua said there will be tribulation. This is no easy ride. But the Word of God says, count it as pure joy. Whatever trials you go through for, this is only temporary. This is not your home. This is not where you will remain forever. Heaven is forever remaining in the presence of God. And hell is eternal separation from God. There's a heaven to gain, and there's a hell to shun. And for some people, this life we live is the only hell that they'll ever know. And for others, this is the only heaven. If you've never said yes to him before and you'd like to say yes to him tonight, just slip up your hand. Just say yes to the Holy One of Israel. Say yes to Yeshua the promised Jewish Messiah, the one who came for all mankind, say that simple prayer. Is there anybody in here tonight that wants to say yes to him? Don't let this night pass you by. Is there anyone? Let's stand to our feet.